with the greatest of all time, the eye test and the National Lacrosse League record book would prove that. He is, of course, the Bandits' current head coach as well in John Tavares. John, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Brian? I'm great. Thank you. And thank you for the time. We're in, a, in an interesting time for young lacrosse fans, young Bandit fans, and older Bandits fans to uh, relive how this fandom came to be through YouTube as we'll air some championship games. And I want to start off with a little trivia, John, uh, not to put you on the spot, but I think this should resonate with you. February 8th, 1992 through February 5th, 1994. What would be the significance of that two year period for the bandits? Well, it took me a while to figure out what you're getting at, but I think we're undefeated amongst that timeline. 22 okay, games. Win, win, win. Yeah, and, and it still stands today and will, uh, you know, unlikely to be broken based on the competitive nature and lengthy seasons now that the league has. But still, it was your first season in the NLL, the Buffalo Bandits, in 1992. And you lost the first three games, which is not to be unexpected for an expansion franchise. But how did your team make such an impression and have this turnaround where for the rest of the regular season and up until the championship game, John, you were outscoring your opponents by an average of eight goals per game. Well, I think the, um, the start of the season going 0-3, it was um, a time of adjustments for a lot of the players. You have to understand that Buffalo team, 1992, 93, the early 90s, um, it was made up of literally an all-star team from Ontario. And um, we have only played literally box across their entire lives. And we were playing against teams that predominantly were made up of American players who traditionally have played field across. So we had sort of an advantage in terms of our skill set and strategy. We just had to adjust to the officiating and the rules of the pro lacrosse game that were a little bit different than the game at home in Ontario. So that, you know, took three games and the speed because the, those field guys are very, very athletic. And uh, that took a little while to adjust, uh, adjust as well. And once we figured that out, obviously we went on a 22 game winning streak, which, uh, which was a lot of fun to be a part of. You know, it's funny when you say that and as I'm speaking, what I remember about that 22 game losing streak is unfortunately the game that we lost <laughs> right. to end that streak. And that was the Boston um, at home. And there was a bit of a brawl in that game as well. <laughs> and then you turn around and beat Boston the next game. Um, you, now, your roster also had a lot of future coaches on it. Uh, would you say that it was yeah. a smart, savvy uh, lacrosse team? Uh, well, I, would, I mean, like I said, it was, it was literally an all-star team from guys predominantly from Ontario. And, like, just thinking the less, like, you know, like Bob Hanley, myself, Cordley Veltman, Keenan, uh, help me out. Any more coaches? The there? Hayes, Hayes and Kilgore, uh, Darius Rich, like literally half of the team. Paul Day. Uh, Paul Day. That's right. <laughs> We're at some point uh, coach and probably still current coaches today. Most of those guys are still in the league coaching. Yeah. It's amazing. Really is. And then prior to Buffalo's existence, Philadelphia was the dominant team and the nineties was just Buffalo, Philadelphia. So we're April 11th, 1992 championship game in your first year. I've mentioned the fact that you've been winning by lopsided margins. This would turn out to be the only one goal game of the season for you guys. How would you describe the ending to the 92 championship to someone who has no knowledge of it? Well, the jump right to, do you want me to jump right to the end of that game? <laughs> well, you tell me because I'm sure that it was a battle of emotions, perhaps ones that you guys hadn't experienced well, because it was so tight. Well, you know, you know, I, I got to give uh, the Philadelphia team a lot of credit because, as you said, you know, we we did dominate um, after losing those three games. We did dominate most games, and Philadelphia did have, you know, predominantly U.S. field across players, and they had, you know, a handful of great Canadian players as well. But I think their coach Tony Rush did an amazing job. Um, of preparing them for us. And if you've never been in the spectrum, it's a very loud, boisterous um, uh, building to play in. And it was a back and forth battle, uh, very you know, high intensity. Uh, it was a great, great, great game right to the end. Um, the couple of highlights that I remember is um, going into the game, uh, 
They, um, they had one of the best goalies league in Dallas, Elliott, and their backup was Dwight Medke. And um, I played lacrosse again with Dwight in Vancouver the previous summer. And Dwight Medke is probably one of the best goalies I've ever played against. He's a goalie in practice that tries on every shot. And he asks you to take specific shots from different angles. And he just studies you and studies you. And by the end of the summer, I could not score on this guy in practice. I could take 30 shots and I wouldn't score a goal. So going into that game, I was just, just hoping, I was hoping that, you know, and no offense to Dallas, that Dallas Elliott was going to start this game because I did not want to shoot against Dwight. From all the goalies I've ever played against, he is definitely the one goalie that was in my head. And uh, Darius Kilgore, heavy shot, you know, he takes a shot, I think just before the half and, you know, it rips Dallas's mask right off his head and uh, probably got a concussion, whatever it was. He, he didn't come back in the second half. And, oh, gosh, my hands just tighten up completely because now I hear it comes Dwight Medke and I'm like, oh, God, not Dwight. So I, I avoided taking shots on Dwight. I was, like, trying to feed as much as I could. And uh, long story short here, um, it's a tight game. We – Gets towards the end of the game with a tie game. We go into a sudden death overtime for the championship in, a, in Buffalo's inaugural year. And it's a loose ball scramble in their end. I pick it up and I have an opportunity to shoot the ball. And I thought, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put it around my back, take a backhand shot or over shoulder because I don't know where this thing's going. So Dwight cannot know where it's going. And uh, Dwight did have a reputation of being weak, five holes. So I just threw the ball down low and Thank God that ball went in. I was so relieved. And uh, it, was a, it was a great victory. The, the Philly fans obviously didn't appreciate it. We had a, actually probably about 1,000 uh, Buffalo fans there, and, and uh, they were cheering for us. And uh, it was a moment I'll never forget. And it was truly just the beginning. Buffalo went to the championship five times in its first six seasons, winning uh, three, uh, all against the Philadelphia Wings. As mentioned, the, the rivalry was just something else between you two. But 1993, John, marked the first title won on the home floor in Banditland. So as fans get ready to watch this one on Friday on YouTube, what should they be watching for as far as plays, players, obscure moments, uh, things of that nature? Well, if you haven't watched any games back in the 90s, um, you're going to notice the game was a little bit rougher. There was definitely a lot more, I'm going to say dirty hits as well, where guys were head hunting and, you know, me included, you know, I took my, my lumps and I gave them back as well. Um, it's a lot rougher style uh, of play. And I would say there was a lot more guys who played two ways. So you have guys that would play defense and run in transition and stay and play. Like, um, you know, a lot of like friends of mine towards the end of my lacrosse career, they started to kind of, you know, nag me a bit about just being an offensive player, not understanding that I used to actually do both for a long period of my career. And I prefer to do that, but you know, obviously with age, you, you can't keep up as much. So, you know, you, you, you tend to do what you can. And, and, uh, I became purely an offensive player. So, and that's what the game is today. Most teams have designated offensive players and designated defensive players. We like to call that an offense-defense system. Where back then, there was more running and gunning. Guys would run the floor and stay and play. And, and you know, you, had, you didn't have as many specialized players, if you will. So that's a big difference. Um, you're going to see uh, in that game, guys like uh, Kevin Alexander, who, you know, is a magician with his stick. He, he scored, I think it was the tying goal uh, right in front of the net, a uh, nice backhand. And you're going to see Darius Kilgoris make some phenomenal passes and, and great shots. And you're going to see a lot of guys like, you know, working hard. And like I said, playing both sides of the floor. And I won't give it away, but who had the guts to call the early penalty on Paul Gate? And I don't know. I think I, I want to, I don't remember who actually brought it up, but we may have talked about it before the game. And I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say somebody and get it wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell I, you this, John. You better remember, this is a long time ago. Yeah. I, I've a lot of thoughts. I don't remember who, who it was. And as you say that, I'm like, we call, I know we called mm -hmm. Gate on a stick violation, but I yep. didn't remember it was that game, actually. So well, it wasn't I'll tell you what. I, and then I the, goal, did the goal get called back? Yeah. And he got a penalty. 
That's right. Yeah, yeah. That was a big turning turning point in that game. <laughs> it was amazing. I'll yeah. tell you what. I I feel like you're reading my notes because the only guy I had singled out was Kevin Alexander. Honestly, what yes, he an would, absolute. He, he, he I mean, would be the guy. He, 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 he would be the guy that I what I would I would choose. That uh, he I, like he's a guy too. He he was probably the one who told Les Barling to call that penalty, right? Because he knows everything about everybody. Like. He'll, he'll tell you how many steps it takes for him to run the floor. Like, he knows everything about every situation. So, like, he's the guy that kind of made you a little paranoid. He goes, your shoe weight, your, your uh, shooting strings and your stick are too long. That's a penalty. You better cut those off. Like, he's the kind of guy that just knew everybody. He just knew every little detail about every situation about the game of lacrosse. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And now, John, as the franchise nears 30 years in existence and with 10 trips to the finals and still seeking that ring for the thumb to, to round it out, uh, um, how would you describe, you know, Buffalo's place in the game of lacrosse? Well, I mean, in 92, I, I, there was, I don't think any lacrosse or minimal lacrosse in Buffalo. And I think, uh, <clears throat> as you can see over the last 30 years that we've, you know, created a very, very good team in Buffalo and an amazing French franchise with loyal fans that support us, you know, year after year after year. And it's made Buffalo, you know, one of the best places to play. Um, you, you also see, you know, the high school and, and university and college lacrosse is growing in Buffalo. Um, I'd love to see the game of box lacrosse start to develop more so in lacrosse in Buffalo. And I think it is. We have a lot of the guys on the team currently and the last couple of years doing a high school program, teaching, you know, kids how to play lacrosse. And, you know, I grew up in, uh, in, in Toronto where, you know, where there, we have a lacrosse box across league. I would like to see the young kids starting to play box across the road to summer like we did here. I think it's a, it's a great game and uh, it's a lot of fun. What are you enjoying most about leading this group in your current uh, position? Well, obviously, the number one thing is winning championships. You know, when you said that we've made 10 championship games, I was like, man, we've only won four. That's not a very good winning percentage in finals. And, and uh, you know, I don't have many regrets with my career. Um, the one thing I'd love to go back is, is the opportunity in those championship games. And, you know, the one thing I'll definitely be telling players when we get back to the finals is these are far fewer in between. you got to capitalize on when you can. You know, like four out of 10. You know, I think so. I was probably four out of nine as a player and one as a coach. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wish that our, our championship winning percentage was a, a little bit higher. Well, I'll tell you what, I think uh, your leaders, um, and, and it may or may not start in your opinion with a guy like Dane Smith, but, but Dane has echoed those sentiments recently. He can't believe his age to this point and experience in the game without having won one and having been there a couple of times. So I think there's definitely that desperation and hunger that you've instilled in these guys already to, to, understand the moment yeah and you know we our last championship win was 2008 and like i'm sure for everybody else time flies i'm like it's it's been 12 years since we won i, I kind of feel like that was just a couple of years ago it says 12 years ago and that's a long time i mean we only have amongst those years a league that has maybe eight to 12 teams on average you know and uh, so you know you, you want to win you want to win a little bit more especially when you have a um, uh, you know, supporting cast like we have in Buffalo and our fans and, and you, we usually have a pretty good team. So we're usually pretty competitive. It's just getting to that final is, is not easy. Winning the finals is not easy. Like you take last year's team and, you know, we, we were a solid team. We had a lot of fun. It was like one big family. You know, it was a party, party, party kind of year. And, you know, it was an amazing place to be. And we faced the team in Calgary where, you know, on paper, people are like, oh, you should win, you should win, you should win. And he starts taking things for granted. You know, things usually don't turn, turn out very well. And, you know, that was a great example. Mind you, I do think they were a lot better than people are giving credit for. They had a lot of injuries throughout the year, and they were peaking at the right time. And they got some great goaltending in that championship game. And not that we didn't. I just thought it was, you know, a great series. And unfortunately, you know, we lost both games. We had a five-minute stretch in the first game at home that, you know, I wish we had back. And you look back at the game in Calgary, <laughs> we missed some opportunities to score and, and they capitalized on theirs. And uh, that series could have gone either way. But back to the point I'm making is, you know, you can never start counting um, you know, before actually you actually win. So you got to uh, make sure you, you don't take anything for granted and, you know, work as hard as you can for everything you're going to get. 
Well, we're definitely counting on uh, you know, Bandits fans and lacrosse fans to really enjoy uh, diving into these past championship games and, and get excited for what comes next and, and when that comes next. We all hope it's sooner rather than later. John, uh, love the storytelling and uh, going down memory lane. Stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brian. Stay safe yourself. Hope to see you, uh, Bandit fans, in, uh, in Buffalo sometime soon. And thanks for all your support.